is J.M. Fry, and I'm a science fiction and fantasy author. Today I will be reading to you from my sophomore novel, The Untold Tales. The Untold Tale is the first book in the Accidental Turn series, which follows Forsyth Turn, younger brother to the great literary hero Kintyre Turn, on all of the adventures that he is forced to go to now that his older brother's adventures are done. I wrote this book because, in part, I wanted to see a fantasy series about people like me. People who can't wield a sword, people who probably can't start a fire in the middle of nowhere and certainly have no idea how to slay a dragon. People who've always used their brains rather than their brawn. And people who are clever and probably talk too much. And thus forceth turn, beta male and little brother who's grown up bullied and in the shadow of a hero was born. The story also follows Pip, a strange woman from another world who knows more about Forsyth and Kintyre and Kintyre's sidekick Bevel than, than she really should. And Forsyth, Forsyth is very intrigued uh, by this woman who knows more about his life than even his own parents really did. So we're, I'm going to pick this up right near the end of the book. Um, so what you need to know at this point is that Kintyre, Bevel, Forsyth and Pip have gone out on a quest to collect items in order to bring them together on the appointed day in order to finish their great quest. One of these items is a magical chalice that they won by playing word games with a sylph. Uh, other things you need to know, Forsyth's sword's name is Smoke and he's also secretly the king's spy master, the shadow hand. <laughs> And Kintyre's sword is named Foe Smiter. I think that's everything. Oh, the horse is! Forsyth's horse is called Dauntless, and Pip's horse is named Carl Urban, which should tell you a little bit about where she comes from. So here we are, we are picking up with our heroes as they walk through the Stoat Forest. We pass into the cool darkness of the trees a few hours before sunset. There is a d debate between Kintyre and Bevel about whether it is better to turn back and camp on the forest's edge where the sight lines are clearer, or whether it is better to do so in the shelter of the forest. Normally I would be angry with Kintyre for presuming to speak for me or to make decisions for me, but right now I do not have the capacity to care. I am tired, footsore, and heart-weary, or maybe just plain tired. I want my bedroll, if only our companions could decide where it should go. The forest path is narrow, and the sunlight slants amber and gold through the leaves. We walk in single file, with me at the head and Kintyre at the tail, Pip and Bevel between us, which, in retrospect, was a foolish thing to do. When the rogue steps out from between the trees and blocks my way, I can only stop in my tracks, sigh, and pinch the bridge of my nose. His sword is up, the blade pocked with rust, and he has the hood of his dagged hem leather cowl pulled theatrically low over his brow. There seems to be an overabundance of buckles on his high boots and a tangle of belts slung across his narrow hips, and I wonder how he stalks through the forest without getting caught in the brambles with every step. Obviously, he's learned how to walk softly enough that all the metal on his clothing doesn't click and give him away. All in all, he is the most cliched portrait of a bandit I have ever had the misfortune to meet. Usually, King Carvel's rangers deal with such brigands, keeping the roads clear for travellers. Whoever is meant to be patrolling Stolt Stoat Forest just earned himself a very severe demotion. The rogue says nothing, just stands there looking threatening, and from the back of the line I hear Kintyre and Bevel's nattering cut off, and the soft, unmistakable, metallic hiss of Foe Smiter being unsheathed. Forsy? Kin asks from behind me. A thief, I assume, I answer back. And before me twitches his sword wavering. A sort of choked howl breaks across the still air of the forest, and I realize that it is Bevel laughing. And trying not to. A thief! He chortles. <laughs> really, let me see! He crashes through the underbrush to stand beside me, and now the rogue's posture goes tense. He takes a step back, sword tip flicking between me and Bevel. Your money or your lives, the rogue intones, and his voice is low, deliberately low and gravelly, and he sounds like a boy play-acting at being a man. This sends Bevel into another fit of poorly contained hysterics, and he has his hand clapped over his mouth, his face going red behind it. 
Come on, boy, he giggles. This is something you want to do? Here? <laughs> now? The rogue wavers. I must point out something very pertinent, I say, flicking back the edge of my cloak so the unmistakable smoke, the shadow iron sword, is visible. The rogue makes a choking noise that, unlike Bevel's, has nothing to do with him laughing. And this, of course, this man beside me, is Sir Bevel Dom. The rogue actually stumbles backward this time, his hood sliding back to reveal a face dark with scruff and dirt and pale with realisation. Uh, uh... I, he says, let us pass, young man, and we will all completely forget that this ever happened, I say, voice carefully modulated to remain soft and calm. Instead of taking me up on the offer, the idiot raises his sword at Bevel. No, I say, that is not the wise choice. Your money or your lives, the rogue demands again. Listen, Pip pipes up, and I turn my head slightly to see that she's got herself half up a tree beside the path in order to see what's going on. Carl's reins wrapped loosely around a nearby limb. Whatever you're stealing t for, to feed your family, or to buy medicine for your ailing mother, or to pay off ruffians threatening to burn your village's crops, trust me when I say that this is not a fight you want to have. You won't win it. Why not just let us help you instead? Miss Piper, Kintyre says, a side quest? We have 17 days left, Pip replies. Surely there's time to rouse some ruffians, right? The rogue draws himself up, insulted. There aren't any, he begins, voice, in, voice squeaking. I mean, <clears throat> my life is none of your concern. You should be more worried about yours. Ugh. Elves, Kintyre groans, and the slam of Foe Smiter back into its sheath rings out. The unnatural hush of the forest has begun to give way to the joyful, noisy birds, joyfully noisy business of birds calling out to their offspring and mates. The rogue, evidently done waiting for us to cut the strings of our coin purses for him, makes a move towards Bevel. Almost faster than I can see, Bevel's got the lad down on his back in the underbrush, the tip of his sword gently dimpling the soft underside of the rogue's chin. Now we have a problem, Bevel says, and his voice is low, dark, and filled with the kind of steel that I've only ever glimpsed in him once or twice before. Contrary to what I would expect, the boy rogue just grins up at the grim granite of Bevel's glower, his mouth spreading wide and eyes crinkling in caddish amusement. I'll say, he crows, and then there is a crash in the underbrush. The bags! Pip shouts, leaning down from the tree, knuckles white around her stabilizing branch. Force it, Pip shouts. There's a... a thief? Oh my god! It's a... <clears throat> Pip goes flying back into the trunk of the tree, and I rush to her side. I'm fine, she snaps down to me. The bags! A flash of red, bright and sharp, catches my eye. Scales glint in the shards of sunlight that pierce the veil of the trees. A low, sibilant hiss fills the air. Another rending tear in the crash and crunch of our gear being scattered along the path, and then a triumphant roar that sounds like a hundred eggs being cracked into a hundred spitting frying pans. Dragon! There is the whip crack of leather wings, and then Pip is down the tree and off like a shot after the creature. Pip, are you mad? I howl after her, reaching out to, to try to pull her to a halt. My fingers brush her back, but I can gain no grip. The chalice! Pip shouts from somewhere be- Kintyre sh shouts from somewhere behind us. Bev, the blasted creature took the chalice! I, ha I can see the vitally important cup clutched in one of the dragon's forepaws. The denseness of the forest and its awkward three-legged gait have slowed the creature down enough for me to see that it is small still, no taller than a horse, no longer than fifteen lengths at most. It is still quite young, probably not even out of its first century yet. I reach for Pip again, fearful that the dragonette will spit fire back over its shoulder at us, but Pip is faster than me. She speeds now after the horrible little lizard, and she once, as she once did after Lord Lingyre. There is a crash and a howl behind me, the frightened whinny of Carl, and then Kintyre is shouting, To one side, brother! I flatten myself against the bush, and Kintyre speeds past me, Fosmider flashing. I follow at his heels. How fortuitous to meet you in my forest! 
The drakeling hisses, rounding suddenly in the middle of what appears to be a close clearing. I've waited an age to have you between my claws, Kintyre Turn. Murderer! A trap. We've been led solidly and stupidly right into a trap. Now the drakeling has room to remove her, maneuver, and it rears back and slashes at Kintyre. Pip skids to on the edge of the clearing, and I fetch up behind her. She grabs my hand, but I do not know if it is out of fear or awe or to keep me from charging into the ar arena with Kintyre. I am swift with smoke, but my sword does not have the heft and strength of Foe Smiter. To go in there would mean a broken blade for me and potentially my death, or that of my brother if he is distracted in defending me. No, I am smart enough to know when I am outmatched. Pip strains forward, shouting, Stop! Both of you, please stop! Murderer! Murderer! The drakeling snarls as each of its strikes are turned back. Forsyth! Bevel shouts from behind me, and it's just enough warning for me to shove Pip and I to the side to avoid the wide arc of the rogue lad's sword. There is blood on his chin and fury in his face as he slashes at us, clumsy in his anger. You leave her be, he snarls. You've done enough. You're the one hacking at me, I snarl back. Stand down or I shall... I need not finish telling him what I shall do because in an instant, Bevel has the boy flat on his face in the dirt, the tip of his sword pressing into the soft flesh at the back of his neck. He is sitting on the boy's waist, his hands pinned to his sides at the wrist by Bevel's knees. Let's try this again, Bevel says. The drakeling makes a moaning hiss like a geyser at the sight of the boy rogue so pinned and bring its, brings its paw down hard on Kintyre's shoulder. It is enough to knock Foe Smiter from his grip and flatten my brother under it. Kintyre! I shout, knowing it's ridiculous to do so, but unable to refrain all the same. Stop! Stop! Everyone, stop! Pip bellows. I don't know if it's the power of a thrice-given command or just the volume of her voice that makes everyone freeze in place, but it works. Beneath the dragon's hand, Kintyre coughs and the drakeling arches its paw just enough to keep him pinned in place beneath its claws, but allowing him to breathe. Bevel makes the same courtesy for the rogue, leaning up enough for the boy to get his face out of the dirt and hack at dust. As soon as he gets his breath back, Kintyre begins to yell invectives, which the drakeling volley, volleys back with fervor. Kintyre wiggles around until he gets his hand on Fosmiter and raises it to slash at the drakeling's arm, but Pip snarls, Don't you dare, Kintyre, turn! And he pauses like a guilty child. Don't hit it! For God's sake, talk to it! Pip orders. Both of you, enough of this phallic weapon waving. Pretend for five goddamn seconds that you are civilized, sentient creatures, and talk. The drakeling's lips pucker in a strange way, and I realize that this is the serpentine version of a mew of confusion. I am talking, it says. I mean to each other, Pip sighs, arms thrown upward in exasperation, with each other? The drakeling looks to Kintyre, and there is a moment that should not be as comical as it seems to me right then as they both shrug. I clap my palm over my mouth and try to keep my shoulders from shaking. It must be the hysteria. Let Kintyre go, Bevel shouts when nobody else seems keen to end the silence, and give us the chalice, or... He whispers his sword against the boy's scalp and a soft pile of dark hair flutters to the ground. No, no, the drakeling says, clearly torn between the chalice in one hand, Kintyre under his other claws, and Bevel's sword at the boy's neck. He's, he's mine, he's mine, you can't hurt him. A delicate sound, like coins clinking together, catches my ears, and I try to figure out if we're being ambushed by someone else. Keeping the drakeling in my periphery, I search the shadows, but there are no telltale glints, no rustling foliage. The glade is still and silent, save for us. I will, Bevel says. I will if you don't hand Kintyre the chalice and let him go. Another soft metallic plinking sound breaks across the air, and I blink as reality tilts ever so slightly, one more veil of mystery about how the world works cut from its mooring and fluttering away. Realization creeps in to take its place. Dragons don't hoard gold, I say quietly. 
they weep it. And that's it from the untold tale. If you'd like to know what happens to the rogue, to the dragon, and to our heroes, please do check out the book. You can find it on my website, the URL for which will be at the end of this video. And if you like this reading series, please do subscribe below. I will be reading more stories as soon as they're published. Thank you for tuning in and see you next time. Thank you.